thing I can share that in my country, uh, some industries are specialized. For example, Uzbekistan, uh, banking is in mostly PwC. Yeah. Oil and gas <coughs> is first and young, and manufacturing is uh, the board. And, and <coughs> they have to turn around every three or five years, depending on the legislation. But they turn around when it comes only for one year and come back to the main well, yeah, main person and after one year. Why is that? Because they have to turn around. Uh, they, it's a part of mandatory order to rotation in certain countries. Okay. And so they want to go they back and ask for the news. Okay, yeah, yeah, I've never heard that before. That's something that would be very interesting to hear that. that. Finding out how much adaptation there is 
In the United no, 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 States, no, you don't have mandatory audit for rotation, but you have mandatory partner no, rotation. Yeah, that's right. And basically, you imagine yeah. it when there is a partner in charge and there is a second partner. Partner in charge goes out, it takes off. Enlarging yeah. it. I don't know what happened. No, no, he leaves. Yeah, I know, they yeah. Totally the engagement. And the guy who was there for a couple of years takes it over. So. Then he leaves and someone else takes it over. Okay, that's that's what happens here. It's every five years, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, and I think in Europe the uh, audit rotation is seven years, isn't it? Uh, five years. Seven. Seven. <coughs> seven. But that's again very hard. Right? So that is this paper, and I like to know the paper is mostly about a kind of auditing study. So uh, then. Worst to 
which are based or complement the current uh, stream with the continuous session. So, main uh, points are uh, shared in this slide. Uh, well, after continuous assurance, uh, if we uh, decide to provide continuous assurance, that means it's going to change the uh, reporting, continuous reporting as well. Uh, and uh, ASCPA gives the difference main difference between audit and insurance, but the uh, first paper uh, discusses what's the difference between uh, 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 continuous assurance and continuous auditing, and what's, what's the meaning of auditing. And uh, it also uh, gives specific examples how uh, continuous assurance uh, adopts uh, its uh, developments from the uh, technological advancements like the ERP systems, broadband networking, barcoding, and uh, lastly, it uh, gives business architecture that has been placed for continuous assurance. So to start with, the uh, uh, paper uh, puts it crucial to uh, to find exact meaning of uh, what's continuous. And uh, uh, is it every month, is it weekly or daily? And uh, what's the distinction between co continuous assurance and continuous auditing? The authors argue that uh, continuous auditing is the only subject of continuous assurance, and the assurance is uh, SP definition of assurance is uh, whatever the whatever the uh, means that can increase the quality of information and the confidence score. And uh, authors uh, give uh, three essential components of uh, providing shoes. First, uh, capturing the data from the transactions of uh, uh, Ashuri. Uh, and uh, these transactions can be transactions of uh, events, processes. And the second uh, component of the assurance is the monitoring and analyzing these uh, captured transactions by Azure. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, Azure will, will uh, report the outcome of this assurance to the uh, interested party. One important point is that uh, I think we're going to talk a little about this in the, the, the payment part. The person who's being assured the company is being assured is not might not be seen as the voice interest in the information and the who is paying for that. Okay. <clears throat> First the essential component of the assurance is a continuous recording of the business transactions. Uh, so paper gives a reason why uh, companies does not need to be uh, constrained to the uh, <coughs> traditional methods of uh, bookkeeping, double entry rules, and uh, other uh, paper-based mostly activities. And they can, instead, they could use these as smart warehouses, look for data interchange, EDXML, VSTOL, and uh, more advanced uh, real-time information tools like the supply and chain management, business process re-engineering, based management and the balance scorecard. In most high volume organizations, transactions can be said to both uh, to take place and potentially be recorded. <coughs> For example, uh, if uh, you go to Walmart or the, some other stores, right, right at the point you made a uh, the sale, they record it in their system automatically. And, and this is an automatic process, nobody has to uh, and make an entry for every sale. <coughs> and, uh, they utilize the bar barcoding and the, the database systems and the RPCs. However, uh, 
a shorter solid real-time information uh, capture for its own sake, for example, uh, to, to make these uh, records available, Walmart thinks only about uh, their needs for this information. They don't care about uh, mostly how assurers or auditors uh, would use this information. So <coughs> just because they is being together continuously does not mean that the uh, assurance can also should be done in the same way. <coughs> For example, uh, maybe they need this uh, continuous data, recording of data for their business, but uh, maybe it's more meaningful for uh, the uh, assurance uh, demanders to have it in your periodic and continuous. The second uh, and third uh, components of insurance are uh, monitoring the transaction, assurance, and reporting. Uh, so, paper gives two main uh, uh, ways of uh, uh, monitoring and ensuring data. First way is uh, continuous monitoring. So, in this, uh, don't create your own system. For example, if you are out uh, making insurance uh, on Walmart transactions, you just capture, take the copy of Walmart transactions, which they recorded, and, and make your uh, monitoring on them. And the second way is uh, reprocessing in the mirror system, uh, which is uh, uh, when, when Walmart uh, records a transaction, your system should also record a transaction independently. And uh, this is the independent source of uh, information in a real, uh, real time enterprise, in a real time basis. For example, uh, the first one is the company is Martin, right? They just monitor what they record. The second one is that they record their own transaction, you record your own transaction independently. Oh, uh, Azure, yes, Azure, and uh, the client. So, and there is a mirror of these uh, two systems. They are there in their own capture, and you are doing yours, and you're gonna uh, make your analysis and monitor on your own uh, data rather than. Of course, this is a this has advantage of uh, independence uh, and uh, less risk, uh, uh, risk but uh, it, it's it's costly, right? It's, it, it, First, you need to have infrastructure to record, uh, record every transaction, and uh, it's just costly and very intensive. Is that a use for it to uh, produce or make a MC layer for the paper that discuss it with monitoring and as a control layer? Control layer? reason for uh, 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 availability of these continuous assurance is increased uh, internet traffic, so, uh, internet connectivity, uh, uh, through which you can uh, transfer uh, large amounts of data from any point to any point. Uh, whether continuous uh, reporting of assurance will be realized or not is not function of technology for the, and the paper argues that the uh, current uh, state of technology already uh, uh, supports the continuous assurance but the main thing is a uh, demand and uh, infrastructure for payment <coughs> and whether these uh, companies want it which is basically not in the absence of legal mandate uh, for assurance it's carried out only some party wants it or demands it. Uh, 
or another party is willing to pay for it. His distinction between uh, continuous assurance and the concept of continuous auditing is uh, um, continuous auditing is uh, mandated, uh, legally mandated. Continuous assurance is a uh, non statute. Uh, is, uh, for public, for example, public trade companies, they have to be audited, uh, but uh, continuous assurance is the most voluntary. And uh, another important point, uh, I think it's going to come in the next slides, but uh, there's a confusion between even in the analysis that uh, sometimes uh, they assume that uh, some of the uh, statements are audited, for example, can use, in fact, uh, they are not. And the most important driver of continuous assurance is uh, demand for the means by which insurance will be reimbursed. Now let's uh, switch the demand for the continuous assurance. So first is the uh, first point is the inverse demand for the assurance. Financial statement audit provides assurance that information is set to present to investors and uh, creditors is reliable. Services adjust audit tradition to wider marketplace. Uh, prog progressive availability of continuous assurance. Uh, technologies will precipitate the changes in the contractual terms between these stakeholders and the company to include provision for some uh, form of high level monitoring and exception reporting. Mm -hmm. And the last point is that despite the uh, AICPA's uh, contention that the uh, Assurance is beneficial where the uh, decisions are made. It's not a certain case that the insurance provides enough uh, payback to justify its cost. Uh, it's because it would be uh, costly to, uh, for companies to have an uh, auditing and insurance uh, same time. Second point is uh, on demand is, uh, is demand for insurance is uh, guarantee uh, and paper discusses several uh, potential demanders for these uh, continuous assurance reports. It might be business partners, employees, local communities, or private companies. Uh, but uh, there are serious problems with these, uh, with these uh, continuous uh, assurance reports that to achieve, for example, there might be disadvantages or the preference of the uh, managers who doesn't want to share the much information, internal information of the company. Uh, although uh, audit teams can, for example, uh, although audit teams uh, gain access monthly statements of the company, they don't use them much and instead they just concentrate themselves to the uh, annual uh, analyzing annual statements. Another reason that there might there may exist there may already exist alternatives using insurance as a way of uh, reducing transaction costs of exchange. Uh, for example uh, the paper discussed about uh, uh, possible alternatives to the Explanations for current lack of non-mandated assurance and <coughs> transactions that have been, not been uh, widely used. Uh, and they, it, made, it makes an assumption that the reason that the assurance is not provided now is that its uh, cost is too high rather than it's, uh, there is no economy mm -hmm. need for it. Next point it switched to is the uh, about demand, uh, demand for real-time assurance. 
So it puts uh, several questions uh, uh, about demand for continuous insurance. Uh, and the first question is that even assuming that demand for insurance will emerge, in what sense will it be continuous? Uh, and the second question is that even if a real-time insurance can be provided, uh, will there be a need for sharing information outside the company for such frequency, for example? Although, uh, let's say, uh, companies are already uh, uh, recording their transactions continuously, but uh, uh, does information users need uh, <coughs> continuous assurance uh, for these reports? Uh, although, uh, there might be a case that uh, these companies are recording their transaction continuously, but uh, uh, information users need this uh, information assurance whenever they need to make a decision, right? Yes. Okay, great. So if you work in a car company, uh, what's the change? Yeah. So, like, this is about the auditor perspective, the car report, the auditors, they will use a lot of, like, Monitoring systems, and also like monitoring systems, yes. to guarantee the uh, like management perspective and <coughs> objectives. So, what kind of like systems are you guys using? In, uh, in in your company, in general model? Yeah. In general models. Uh, this would go off topic, but uh, uh, in the case of GM, what they used to do is that they have a general control. Yeah. Uh, for example, if they are if there is a too much overtime for some department. And it doesn't have to relate to the financial statements. It's any uh, anything that relates to company objectives. Uh, it can be uh, too much consumption of the resources, and that and these are uh, general controls, right? Are they real time? Like uh, it's, they are not mostly continuous uh, unless it's. Uh, well, continuous is the uh, term continuous is a subjective thing. Like, uh, what do you mean continuous? It's every month, it's every week, day, or I, every day. I always say every hour. continuous depends on the cost of the application. At Bell Labs, at any time, you used to have a switch. Anytime you pick up the phone, your landline, it will record your call, but the switch cannot be touched. So, you only could get yeah, data when the switch data was downloaded from the switch, was two hour cycles, okay? The billing was monthly, uh, 20 cycles a month. So it made very little sense examining the billing in the middle of the cycle. So the cycle there was monthly. Uh, however, there were certain things that the immediate detection, like for example, problems in printing bills uh, had to be immediately detected or you is sending out millions of wrong bills. Okay, so that that was what we thought at ATP about this. Uh, and since then, many situations we reiterated this idea of the pulse of the application, what continuous means. So his response was was to hear. But uh, think about this as as really maybe a few a few parallel cycles. One is measuring the business while it's operating. You talking about GM, I was thinking about the paper pulp plant. <coughs> the paper pulp plant is about the size of this block. It has walls outside and they pour stuff in this big oven, okay? And they have all this monitoring equipment and there is not enough water, it perceives it and sends it in more uh, paper, more of the raw materials, they fit it in, air, and etc. It's constantly measuring it and adjusting. It's what they call a cyber feedback system or a feedback system that self-adjusts for, in this case, for production. And then there are things in, for example, in car manufacturing, uh, they call it just in time, and things are arriving, and if something goes wrong there, you need to detect it before the cycle goes bust. Okay, so that's very close to operations. And then there is whole area of business measurement, which is measuring operations, of production, but also measures other things, billing, this and that and that. And then there is this thing of assuring 
that those processes are good. And those are done by internal guys and by external guys. So it's like really real-time production. Uh, I don't know if it goes here or here. Uh, then this whole thing of measurement for production. And then there is making sure that what's being measured is being measured correctly. And that's done internally and externally. And the economics of it are different. <coughs> And the one thing uh, that I'll be sharing is the GM uh, lines that uh, globally share is the, the co program called the MGO, the Material Global Optimization. And in this system, uh, all GM lines uh, uh, members have their uh, the inventory management. What is GM Alliance? The GM Alliance is the uh, GM created alliance and uh, whoever wants to produce their cars, uh -huh. they have to buy their uh, models, they have infrastructure only from them. I, I didn't know about GM, I know that Boeing does that. Mm -hmm. Boeing has, not exactly that, Boeing has seven <coughs> worldwide suppliers that feed into the green line and, and etc. And they all kind of try to work together. But it's not like the sky, the sky is the platform needs to be using materials from the from what you call the alliance. Yeah. Uh, Boeing is really kind of production <coughs> line from many countries going into CF. Actually it's uh, one of the business concepts of GM uh, Detroit to make uh, money from the members of the alliance. Actually every transaction costs several cents for this uh, GM alliance. So GM Uzbekistan used to be a part of GM, actually part of that company, but starting in the last year, GM Detroit said, okay, you guys are open, you're an independent company, we don't require any training from you, but uh, you have to be a GM alliance. If you want uh, new models, new technologies, you have to buy it from us, not from you. Not from you not. And vice versa. Uh, yeah. GM also needs to buy from the members of the alliance. Well, you mean the GM Alliance needs the... No, no, GM itself, I like uh, Chevrolet. <coughs> well, the, I don't think, I can't think of anything they can buy from the members of the bank, because it's mostly one way uh, chain. Uh, okay, so it's like, like going to yeah. the like supply chain, and uh, you basically, well, no, Boeing, I don't think Boeing requires members of the Alliance to buy from Boeing. But I don't know. I don't know. In commerce, we see that added value. So it's like, oh, but you have the added values? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's more than technology, added value. But it's the problem. All the text problem comes from I, I just want to let you finish, and I want to do uh, the Barcelona and Halper paper, and then I will talk a lot about it. So move ahead. I tried to keep quiet. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, next big point is that uh, pay for continuous insurance. Uh, so it's definitely uh, needed to be uh, infrastructure for payment. Uh, of course, uh, continuous insurance do not do this for free. But uh, who, who, first question is uh, who is going to pay for this? Uh, is the person who actually is it the assurer who is uh, being insured or uh, the difference, uh, the most uh, important difference between assurance and uh, audit and assurance is that the uh, uh, demand for assur uh, assurance may not come from the single point. Maybe several stakeholders in the environment can benefit from that. And uh, one main uh, uh, important also to derive from this environment is the free ridership when the one person uh, has bought the assurance in this environment, others can assume that since uh, this, he has bought this assurance, probably assurance is positive and uh, don't pay for assurance and assume it's already assured. The What's the cost of uh, <coughs> continuous assurance? The main cost from uh, comes from uh, 
technological uh, advancements, uh, papers uh, argue that uh, although uh, hardware, is, hardware, hardware cost is decreasing, the software production and systems are not necessarily decreasing, and the important uh, part of this uh, assurance providing is not only the technology, but the papers uh, that the uh, assurers use, they have to train their Carry their uh, personnel to have the necessary skills to conduct these assurances. And the uh, next part is uh, who is who is uh, who is the owner of these uh, assurance products? So assurance uh, is issued now. It's the is it the product of the assurer or the or the entity who is being insured? Uh, for example, uh, Assure can uh, uh, argue that uh, it's uh, his efforts and his uh, expenses that uh, conducted these assures. And on the other hand, uh, Assure can uh, uh, also argue that it's his uh, data, it's the uh, infrastructure that provides information. And the last uh, uh, point on the thing for assures is the analysis of uh, continuous assurance in ASP setting. ASP is the application service provider. For example, in the modern world, many companies outsource their systems uh, from uh, external software companies. Uh, you can find say, several ERP systems and accounting softwares. So, main question is, uh, who should be paying for this assurance? So if, for example, uh, external party or interested party wants an assurance in this, uh, for example, accounting software, how it's uh, working, is it, uh, is it uh, working correctly, properly? So uh, on one hand, uh, it's also interest of, interest of uh, ASP, uh, application service providers, no, on the other hand, the company who is outsourcing this uh, software is also interested in this uh, uh, proper working of this software. So when, uh, for example, uh, things get specialized, these uh, assurer providers get specialized in certain uh, software, they can become a de facto uh, business partner and uh, earn more revenues on this assurance of a certain package. The last uh, uh, point in this paper on the analysis is the uh, assurance independence and uh, how it's affected uh, with this in the assurance, continuous assurance uh, environment. Uh, the yeah, secure rule of the independence is that the assurer does not have any uh, uh, psychic or the economic interest in the company, but uh, authors suggest uh, that uh, this standard is uh, hard to achieve in the context of uh, continuous insurance. They, uh, they state that uh, to achieve a full continuous insurance, there should be a Technological infrastructure built in, in the, uh, the entity that's being insured, and that they should they should analyze these uh, uh, transactions in detail. So uh, sometimes they may uh, state the rules, certain rules, how to build this uh, infrastructure in the, at the uh, assurer. So there might be some uh, uh, loss in the independence of the assurer. And lastly, uh, uh, paper gives uh, areas for research. Uh, can we analyze further that uh, what are the essential uh, components of continuous assurance? Uh, uh, further research can be done uh, on demand for assurance and uh, payments for assurance and uh, how each, uh, independence of insurer can be affected and uh, uh, how technical uh, 
details of technical uh, architect of the continuous instruments we developed. And these are the conclusion of the paper. So uh, most important attention in discussion of the continuous instruments as far as being a technological uh, uh, aspect, but the what has been less focused on is the uh, demand and e economic uh, infrastructure that's needed for continuous insurance. The stone essential components <coughs> of insurance are capturing data, monitoring, analyzing, and uh, communicating the outcome. <coughs> Existence of such needs uh, does not imply that insurance is the only possible solution. Uh, there can be some other economic viable uh, alternatives Many issues arise concerning payment trust, uh, structures and services, multiple customers and free rider phenomena. Continuous insurance engagement would likely consist of uh, a mix of uh, specialized reports provided on demand. The uh, last main continuous insurance is fundamental issues concerning assurance independence uh, and will probably balance the trade off of the insurance of the thing. I could just wait for the justice a little bit. Can you just talk about the Barcelona and Alpha? Who is doing that? A or you? A. Okay, let's do it fast because okay. we're kind of running out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. No, you didn't. While he's talking. Think about this is the old thing. What does modern technology affect this? And uh, you can think about what modern technology affects what I am talking to. So the paper basically is um, about continuous audit. On my system start. I think this is the second paper about continuous audit. First paper, sorry. Well, it depends. If you take. Uh, <coughs> Well, you should take a paper by Granoff and Moody, or Moody and Granoff, uh, talking about embedded audit modules. It could be the second. But this is, that was just conceptual. This is a real example. This is the work I did at Bell Labs from 86 it's to 91. It's called Bell Laboratories, fraud with an AT&T, right? right. This paper is developed. Uh, uh, Concept of and explore uh, of the issues with the with the alternative uh, audit procedure using um, the um, technology. Uh, the technology there's two basic one. It's the continuous process audit um, technology and the uh, <coughs> system that used uh, that was developed in AT and T um, the laboratory um, by Professor Nicholas and his team uh, was called uh, the continuous process audit system and. Uh, that could be, that's your, basically used for a terminal audit, but uh, at that time it's also, uh, it could, uh, was, could be used for the external audit functions. So just to go, uh, just to give you a history about uh, the, the evaluation of audit form and data processing for, uh, perspective. And uh, from 1945 to 1955, there is the input, output, and processing uh, Data processing functions, as it shows here in the uh, table. Um, the application was uh, developed uh, for like science, scientists uh, and military applications. Uh, one of the examples was an Manhattan project. Um, the problem with it was the data transportation and repetitive processing was a bit. Processing. Another one is the including those three processes in, in 1965 to uh, 50, uh, 65. There was like the storage, was the magnetic, like netted, uh, the, the tapes that I remember that there were like that tapes that you can say or storage your data. The problem with it, um, sometimes it can it, it be damaged frequently and also. Are easily and can be readable. 
uh, then the convocation that the base and their workstation and then uh, make a decision. Uh, when we talk about making a decision here in, from 1991 to uh, uh, at the time of the paper, it's a decision that decision uh, supports the system. How would you, you know, this is written in 89, 90, published in 91. Um, how, what would you classify the stages after 91? Obviously, today we would be talking about artificial intelligence systems and et cetera. Yeah, this paper needs an update. So, I don't know. know. <laughs> they are talking a lot about this robotic process automation thing, which is automation of the steps of the traditional office, right? And so, I don't know, it's kind of really interesting. I also looked at this table at home, and I thought, that, you know, the dates are old, but the, but the content, decision that you can formalize and under the not other repetitive decisions or not repetitive decisions that are very difficult to formalize because the context is very different in each one of them. Uh, we haven't done a lot of decision classification correct? But this is something that we eventually will need to do, but we don't have enough cases to, to Hopefully work. after the, the RPA firms we can I wonder how if the firms have done some research in the Well, I know uh, E and Y presented at the annual meeting, in the technology meeting before it, uh, what they call RPA in tax. And they divided, uh, they said that they had around 400 tasks, 80 of them they thought they would automate, uh, and they have done eight already. Okay, so they did eight out of 400. Um, but maybe tax is more, is more in the domain of uh, time and motion, right? Or in the <coughs> So uh, companies at that time, they were using a uh, confirmation-based uh, system that helped them to make a uh, decision and uh, do the operation. Um, most importantly, many of those systems are real-time systems where by continuous updating and received, uh, received and processed transactions inclusively. So, uh, so the, to audit those uh, systems uh, as shown at the table below, um, required both audit system itself and also examining um, the reconciliation of the entire basis uh, between systems. So the system depends on the audit uh, system uh, starting <coughs> at or extraction uh, of the data from the database. So talking about the table below, it uh, shows some characteristics of the database system, um, the two audit uh, techniques, which is level one and level two, that can be used and measure those systems. So for example, level one here in the table, uh, by examining of the uh, documentation, documentation request for the user query, 
for the database and exam uh, application, summary data, they sorted it and listed it very close by the user, not the order. Then, a level two, tax, uh, we use that computer to perform database audits, as well as annotate uh, the uh, inter, uh, intermediation by the user or the system people. So in the second level two uh, could uh, or, uh, reduce the risk of fraud data extraction by the entity. <coughs> uh, that's one of the things that uh, uh, help to 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 evaluate uh, fraud data extraction. So uh, continuous audit processing. Uh, um, are mentioned, analyzed, continuous daily, and that's using a set of auditor uh, defined rules, consider a uh, metform of the uh, control, could be used in monitoring controls compliance, that's the compliance. So the system, as I talked to you guys before, the game, CTAM, um, it's, uh, it's developed by uh, the Bell Lab, that the system is changed the nature of the evidence, <coughs> also timing and type of the procedures and uh, allocation of the operators involved in all this work. Uh, so the approach adopted can be continuous process of the system is to condense the, uh, the uh, data origins model that feeds an independent and external advanced decision support system. So those data provision can be accomplished by data extraction <coughs> from the standard application report using the platform matching techniques. Then data extraction from the file that feeds the application report. Um, then recorded the direct entry that we'll go in the steps of the approach used. So we have the measure, uh, measurement and monitoring and analysis and we have the metrics, the analytics and alarms. Um, so first of all, measurement is basically taking the measurement reports and then store it in the system, in the database. Monitoring is limited, uh, the audit models will be uh, implemented <coughs> into the OST system that this could uh, allow the auditor to continuously monitor the system, provide a significant uh, uh, control, and also monitoring points for management to be able to uh, read track any transaction. <coughs> um, analyzing here is the audit's work broken into two states. Uh, the first one is the startup stage where the auditor works with the developers users and other creative view of the system. Second stage is the use stage when the chair or he actually use the system for actual operation on this procedure. So here the audit act as uh, internal audit, uh, internal, uh, internal control in the buyer. Uh, some of those uh, audit tests uh, could be the files to be quoted and extended uh, or re-cancellation to be performed. So, um, metrics here is to, uh, the, this is the, uh, yeah, this is the fourth stage, which is uh, directly <coughs> measurement of the system. Uh, that's directly reports that any uh, uh, metrics are compared to the system standards. If the standard is ex uh, exists, then the alarm appears on the system standard. Um, analytics here is to uh, define a function, uh, the natural flow, uh, logic, and environmental uh, has been observed that the relationship of, uh, among the metrics. Uh, so we can uh, evaluate them. Uh, so each uh, analytic may have minimum peak dimension. So the first one, a general stru uh, structure. The other one is relationship and that determines the number of value of the value times and situation, rule of the thumb, or the actual rules on the magnitude 
but the same variables that it, I don't think they're changing at all, except putting on a different platform. Um, and uh, many of the things that we imagined at the beginning, or a few things we imagined at the beginning, um, didn't develop the way we thought, developed in different ways. Um, but uh, the concept I thought was pretty valid, and this is the first and ever, ever seen this kind real-time audit system. And then we are past 35 years, there is all kinds of books on it and, uh, and uh, publications, and now we are hearing that uh, PwC has a very active continuous audit practice for internal audit. Uh, ENY seems to be doing something in the line too. Uh, but what they call continuous audit, what I don't <coughs> think, I don't think that what they call continuous audit is really continuous audit. And I say with Tau that we have been working, they call a whole continuous audit group, but they repeat the audit once a month, kind of the more traditional. And I don't think that that's a real continuous audit. Uh, and that's kind of the discussion I wanted. Hey, do you have anything else you want yeah. to show? Yeah, this yeah. is the billing system I want to show. Oh, okay, stop at the billing system back. That's why I tell you to talk about that. We used to have little boxes under those boxes with number of transactions flowing, and we never really used that. So that was one of the things we thought. But you see the hypertext in the left? Uh, that's, I don't see very often. Sometimes in the web thing, there was a little globe that we use and you clicked in the globe and you saw, you could go and click three levels below directly using that tree on the left. You see the tree in the left there? Yeah. Okay, and then we actually wrote the visual interface. So, so the auditors themselves would develop this. We wrote like a, a little, uh, and uh, they did. We had, a, there was a billing system of rats in Florida for something that he was doing and uh, the auditors design the interfaces for them. So that's also a good proof of this. And this is the alarm from the billing system. We have here two uh, type three alarms and one type four. And uh, then here another, sorry. It's uh, going to show uh, the figure how, so here we have the accounts. Here we have 10 account accounts missing. This is where the thing comes goes to the process. So the system <coughs> shows that, and this is how it be tracked. And a lot of analytics at that time were graphical. That's graphical. And uh, you know how these things were developed? Uh, there was a guy in our group mm -hmm. called Kazuo Ezawa, and he was uh, obviously Japanese, uh, uh, with a degree of uh, uh, industrial engineering in Stanford, a PhD in Stanford. And he had a little map and uh, he would pick up the data, put it in his Mac, develop a monitoring method, and when it worked, he kept collecting data manually. When it works and it's ready to go, and he would put, we would put it operational in the system. That's the way he wanted to do it. You know, you don't argue with scientists, you kind of work with them. Right? That's the way Kazu wanted to do it. And he did hundreds of these things, of these analytics. Uh, we had another interesting episode. Uh, I have the chart, I don't know where it is, whereby we are sending bills out <coughs> and the bill completion standard was 98%. So meaning 98% of the bills have to go out uh, right according to our standard. <coughs> and we started seeing overnight this going down to 50, 45%, 30. And of course, this was, I stopped the system. I stopped the entire system of billing and said something going very wrong here. And uh, what happened is that an operator had twice loaded the same tape, so the same data had been read in twice. And then he thought was a programmer, he multiplied every field by minus one and read it once more. And so the negative accounts, everything exploded. So I, I was at home, I heard about it, and I said, stop. I mean, this big effect on the building of AT&T stock. And so uh, that was resolved, they started it, and then I get this very nasty phone call from uh, the billing guys saying, uh, you know, why did you dare to stop it? They stopped our data streams. We were not getting made. 
I was a fan of the CR4 of at that time, the ex partner who was a lineman. Uh, and I called him up for the name of Bob Carter, and he called Bill Lincoln. They restarted the day. But then I went to meet with them, and I chose the two biggest guys in my group because I knew they would yell at me. <laughs> and, and so it was actually was very interesting. We had a very contentious meeting for about 20 minutes. And then I showed them the reports we had, and you go, how do you have this? How do you have that? And I explained how we did it after one industry there. And I left the day with a, with a contract that they had, a million dollars agreement with them that we would do a system for them. And that took me a few weeks. A million dollars in 1986 was a lot of money. Okay, but uh, it was like a five FPA, meaning five PhDs working on it. That was the contract. And so then I had to work with the inter-audit organization. This is okay that they have the same data. Your analysis will be different. And maybe when I, I left Bell Labs full time in 89, came here, uh, but I remained an employee of Bell Labs for until five years ago, four years ago when I retired. Um, but this whole, this whole thing happened at Bell Labs. And then they had this thing they call post-mortem analysis. Finish a project, give it to the user, and we did give the prototype, went with the user, or internal auditing and, or, and sales. And then a group of scientists analyzes what you did and tell you what you did wrong. And so there was this metallurgist experts and whatever. And the thing they didn't like from the system was our method of collecting data. They said we should go directly against the database. But that wasn't possible. So we collected data by scraping screens. That's what called today at that time was we called it. Um, and you know, by the time I left the lab, there were 40 or 50 projects collecting data that way. It's just the scientists didn't have an idea that this was going to. So the system went over to, uh, to audit and to building. I left the lab full time, and I started working other things part time on the labs. And that was a mistake because uh, my public, uh, you know, half of the things I was doing, I couldn't publish when I was in Bell Labs. This one, they were pretty good, but later on, the, they became very fashioned by competition, and they started becoming very proprietary, patent they got it. So, a Bell Lab, if you got the patent, they gave a $1,000, and it was their patent. Okay, and so what did they your name? So the only patent I have in my name officially is a patent I did with Raj River Starter. Uh, on, on collecting, on this thing it all seek info, which is tax mining of 10Ks and 4Ks and etc. But I did a lot of work that uh, eventually was happening. Some of the work I did is, uh, was network analysis, inbound, outbound calling. That's the thing they use these days to look for terrorists and the same does, does that. So we did work on that, we made the data and did this. Um, I still think this was my best project, from what my main project anyway, at Labs. And there was a time that I needed 30 people working on this. And that decided me to leave the Labs. I, we at the business analysis center where I was, uh, I was the first person I ever hired in the lab with a business degree, not a, I had an engineering degree before, but this was PhD in information systems. Uh, and after me, they hired me with marketing, industrial engineering, they put my court, or here is Fern Halpert. And Fern was actually an oceanographer, PhD in oceanography. <coughs> they did spectral analysis of the Gulf of Mexico waves. Uh, but the, after me, they hired a, a lot of people uh, with kind of business skills, because they realized it was difficult. But it was after about five years there, I had this big group working and we had started the MIMS project, which was a tax mining project. And uh, they tell me, well, part of your job is uh, sitting down with everyone in your group and planning their career. This would be a half a day exercise. So I figured out that I would be spending every six months, one month, doing career planning with me. 
and I said that's not what I want to do, and I accepted the job here at Rutgers. Uh, and uh, actually, I was close for accepting a job here, and I had was talking to talk to him. Talk. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm having a family crisis. My my cousin has been uh, hospitalized. She's in emergency at this moment. So, but anyway, I uh, I didn't want to do to do that uh, that kind of bureaucratic thing. Um, and so I, uh, I came here, but when I was talking in Michigan, I was talking a uh, couple of schools. I had left Columbia. I didn't want to go back there. I don't want to do the work, but I couldn't go back there anyway, except in a non tenure track. Um, uh, the head of the Bell Labs called up uh, the dean here and said, let's do a sharing agreement. So I was shared. <laughs> and it was a big mistake. My brother, very smart, my brother told me, you know, you already have Bell Labs in your name, you have a couple of good projects there. If you like it, I mean, go and stay there full time. But I, <coughs> I was there, and the end was total waste of time, in my opinion. I got here, and my publications, when I got full time here, <coughs> publication multiplied by three in per year, because then I wasn't forbidden to publish them. So uh, I like this project. Uh, I still think this project is a future, but has it. Uh, are, you, are you done or yeah, is there one? Yeah, just the conclusion. Okay, so let me, uh, let me just kind of have a little discussion, okay? okay. Um, so can I ask you a question? What is this idea of continuous auditing and what's obsolete from this materials that, that we showed you and uh, what do you think is going to be happening on the future? You know, this is not our regular seminar. This is my topic, and so I'm abusing my rights. Okay? Uh, so, remember, what I just said is these are production measurements. Okay? Okay, and then there are other things that are not production things like accounting, etc. And then there is assurance, internal audit, and then there is external audit. External audit. And you know the literature, the practical literature talk about lines of defense, and they call it first line of defense management, second line of defense internal audit, third line of defense uh, external audit. But some people call it four lines of defense, some people call it differently. I, I don't like that notation, it's so practical for my case. Okay, uh, but that's the way they uh, typically characterize it. And just for your date story, this project was done between 1986 and 1990. <coughs> I got to learn this 1989. Okay, and called the CFAS project. And then in 1999, the ASCPA published what we call the Land Book, the Book of Continuous Audit. So it was the first statutory thing on continuous auditing. And then in 2003, the IIA Publish their guidance. And then in 2010, Isaac, Commission Institute of Internal Auditors, called Information Audit and Control, published their guidance. And last year, or no, the year before, 2016, <coughs> we published the Pink Book. The Red Book, Pink Book. Pink Book was also AICPA. And uh, remind me to send them a copy of the, of the big book. We have a like, PDF version of something. And, and so what, what happened here is progressively there is more recognition of the need of a closer to, to the event audit. Okay, I was, I thought, uh, you know, you, you write papers and then I looked at the title of this paper, right? but you don't remember what you wrote on the papers. 
And I thought Louisville's discussion was very good. It reminded me a lot of the things that, that uh, you know, was Michael, Alice, and Alex and me. And Michael is an economist, Michael, or at least he thinks economic, economically. And so I remember now the discussions we had. And now I remember why I, I do my analogy of uh, an umbrella. And the umbrella is assurance. And within assurance, you have little pieces, which is the regular order, external order, and then other things. And, and uh, I, I think under this umbrella, progressively we're going to have more of this. Now the book, the, the paper that he was talking, he you know, was talking about continuous reporting. And what is continuous reporting? What I imagined at that time I was thinking is about the balance sheet and income statement, the funds flow every day. And they actually had uh, like a couple of companies have developed uh, kind of what they call virtual close, and the virtual close is daily closings. Okay, uh, but remember, many of these companies and many of these systems work in big, still work in big mainframe systems, and what they do is a nighttime cycle. They support online during daytime, like the banks, and at nighttime they run the big operations. Um, and so if you go in Citibank and you look at your account online, it's actually picking up last night's and updating it in a kind of, and overnight and they update today's operation really officially. And progressively this is a period, but uh, there are billions of lines of code in COBOL that are still being used everywhere. And you know, you go to any organization like at and or IBM, etc., they still do a lot of their things in large mainframes. Even if you think that everything is internet and, and online and etc. No. But uh, this idea, I actually think differently about continuous reporting than I spent at that time. At that time, I talked about virtual clothes, I discussed it in my classes, etc. Uh, and you heard me talk about, I think that the balance sheet and the income statement are kind of obsolete measurement schemes, and I think you, I said here in the first day of class, and I said this thing about, uh, you know, it's cash, receivables, payables. Maybe inventory, no inventory, yes. And maybe a few things in property plan equipment is useful. But besides that, most of the things, does you think anyone does analysis on owner's equity? Meaning those intangibles, does anyone look at that very much? Look for events, but doesn't look for day-to-day -day changes on the thing. And the whole thing of depreciation it's just a tax thing. Okay, do you really think that the building depreciates in 17 years or in 10 years and uh, the value disappears that way? It's just a tax thing. And it doesn't serve for anything uh, except tax savings or tax expenditures and etc. So, uh, but what has happened in firms is that they have developed these uh, ERPs and uh, you all heard about ERPs, but uh, just for our accounting students' advantage, it's basically a big relation, that, relation database and applications around it. Anything from human resources, payroll, to cost, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Depending on the type of business that you have, There'll be manufacturing, there'll be banking, there's going to be universities, all kinds of things, and then the applications are going to be different. But it's a common database or a common set of databases and access to them. Therefore, if this application changes this, this one uses it. In the old, day, old days, what well, kind of is joined, they call file systems. Professor Kogan mentioned a little bit of it last Tuesday afternoon class. And they were 
out of sync because of the updating tapes in different ways. But, uh, but the relational databases contain data is not only financial data. And this is the result out of this. They don't run up looking at the balance sheet. Now, if you knew uh, Fra Luca Pacioli in 1492, the reason why he created the double entry bookkeeping and etc. first they made a lot of accounting errors and they, they had things that were wrong. And then the second thing is they needed to know how much money you owe, uh, how much inventory you have, and it started this whole thing the Venetian traders. You are a Venetian trader, he, he is one of his, he is associates in other country, they need uh, this inventory belongs to him or belongs to him or what's happening was sold. They needed to run their business. And it was really very debt and physical goods. That were the two things that they had. And then the third thing, so debt, physical goods, and then became them sharing the money. Okay, meaning, oh, you are giving me half of the profits. The moment you see profits, they have to figure out what the profit is and say, this costed me this, this was. And so that's kind of what they did. But today, for you to run a business, um, meaning Microsoft doesn't have a lot of inventory, correct? And they don't buy things to sell on inventory. They do some, but not too much. OK? And uh, Google doesn't do very much of that at all. OK? Apple buys a lot of parts. Uh, but what happened is that the kind of the physical goods uh, kind of re reduced in importance in this information society we are. But we still have the whole balance sheet and income statement reports. And yesterday I was telling my son, who is an analyst, that those don't have a lot of value. He around that. He really didn't that upset me because the entire business model of theirs is examining those things and deciding if you buy this stock or don't buy that stock. But uh, you heard me saying the other part of it, maybe 80% or 75% of all trades are automatic trades, algorithmic trades, okay? And they basically go on price changes, volume changes, and what the competitor might be doing. So one company is undervalued <coughs> in relation to the other. And by the way, that thing my son does too. Okay, because you can't really uh, trade on, from second to second on a financial statement that's a year old or a quarter old. Um, and so that's kind of what the environment happened. And what the environment happened is uh, you run your business not on physical, you use physical inventory cash, but you look at human resources, patterns, um, you know, in things like selling software, you look at sales over the internet, very physical, non-physical things. And for the financial statements, those things are eventually transferred in cash. And if you heard Professor Kogan say uh, last Tuesday, he said, the best part of all the business cycle already happened before you book a transaction, before you post an entry. Okay, and that actually wasn't Kogan, that was originally said by Bill McCarthy with his ERA stuff that Alex talked last time. Uh, but uh, for running a business, after the event happens, it's late. You want it to happen before the event, before the subsequent events happen. You find a fraudulent transaction. You don't want to pay the fraud, fraudulent transaction and only $10 million goes to Switzerland, and then you discover what's fraudulent. You can't find the money in it. What you want it to stop is before it goes to Switzerland. So in those, when you are making your payments, do a suspicion function, find out things that are dangerous, and then examine it carefully before you execute it, even if you have to hold it back. Uh, but, so this idea of continuous reporting, I have kind of expanded the thinking on this of saying, uh, maybe real-time financial statements would be a good thing in certain accounts. But I think we need much more than that. Okay? And uh, in our conference, we have this very big discussion 
continuous monitoring versus continuous audit. We did care about CACM, okay, continuous audit monitoring. And uh, basically, what is continuous monitoring is comparing, it's always the same kind of thing, is there is a, there is a model and there is an actual. And you compare them. Okay, and so let's say this is your model, this is your action. Actually, pick up on NPR2. This difference, the delta, is the call of alert. And then you usually have a standard, say, this is my allowable variance. If this thing is bigger than my allowable variance, we create an alert. If it's not bigger, then there is a value. There is always a value most of the time. But if it's not bigger, and you use absolute value because it could be negative values. Okay? And so then you create another. And this constant applies to a lot of things. To a lot of things. It's very, very simple. Meaning there is and of course that's what they do in the paper about mills. Okay, they, if there is a little difference of the number of how much water there should be there, they don't care. If there is some sort of difference, they take action. They inject more water with the water they did. So that applies to physical, applies to economy, <coughs> applies to patterns, applies to everything. Understanding patterns. Yes, I have a question. Although it's a variance, I'm devising Okay, hold on a second, I'll talk about that. Okay, I'll put your name there, help me a little bit. Okay. I'm getting there. I think I know three out of four, so I'm doing good. And you too, put name in front of me. Uh, okay, now, materiality. Okay, we talked materiality last time and I already mentioned this. What is materiality? Materiality is the auditing concept or the accounting concept of acceptable relative error. And what I said is you measure this table, you have a length. If you measure more carefully, you have a more accurate length. Okay? So there is always implicit an allowable error. It's an engineering concept. The engineers talk about that all the time. Okay? And Materiality in auditing is allowable error. Now, it's more interesting than that because of the following. Auditing has a cost. Auditing maybe has a value. Okay? And now, you don't want auditing to cost more than it has value. That's what the discussion you were starting, starting to talk about, is you don't want to do that. Okay, so what happens? You don't examine things down to the cent. Because what's the advantage of finding one cent off? They added it wrong. Okay, it's basically something that is worth investing. And the more you examine, you get more accurate. You get better tools and etc. And so basically the, uh, the wording on the financial status we should wash. <coughs> Fairly represents economic activities of this firm. Fairly means not exactly materially correct. That's just kind of there on that discussion of materiality. Allowable relative error. Now, what has happened, and I'm advancing here, what has happened is that those concepts of what was the audit procedure that were performing were all manual. And costed you so many dollars to go and look at an invoice, and etc. But today you look at an invoice electronically. And so the trade-offs between what we're doing or not have changed, but auditing has not changed. And that's the big problem. You know, uh, Ian, Zhao Kai, Ian, is doing his dissertation on, uh, on content. And what he's doing, and he's scanning PDFs, creating this contract with some errors, and then he text mines it and takes out variables that matter. 
And exam is a variable to understand. First, if the paragraphs of those content has not been modified. Second thing, what are the variables that you need to analyze? The cost of this contract, the revenue, how it's paid, and et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is a total change on examining contracts. Why? Because in old days, what do you do to examine contracts? You pick it up. First, you didn't understand the legalese. Okay, so uh, pick up and pick up the variables by hand. And so it wasn't, the payoff was not there to examine. AT&T has tens of thousands of contracts with people that sell telephones for them. Okay, it's not only AT&T stores that are, does it. And so at that time, there was no benefit to look at the contract. Now with Ian's methodology or some of the CPA firms are doing that, you can examine every single contract and get attention called to something that's very big, something that has been changed by a lawyer, or some ratios that don't make sense. You know, you pay me one cent per telephone that you sell. The telephone costs you five, six hundred dollars to sell it, so that was a friend of yours. You wanted him to make money, and he'll make your payoff. Okay? So, what happened is, now you have this technological ability to examine contracts. Now you have to go back into thinking about the audit and reframe your problem. I call this thing TPR, Technological Process Reframing. And I was under the impression that Ahmed was going to be working on this, but he still didn't get there. Okay? And so over there, it's uh, Issa, uh, the paper is Issa and Vassarelli, Issa, someone in Vassarelli, uh, 2016. Uh, okay, and the idea is you reframe, in this case, the focus only is in the audit, you reframe what an audit is based on the technology that you discovered and that you can apply. My example was contract, but sampling will be another example once you have a better technology in sampling, you will think what gets sampled and in what way. I think judgmental sampling will happen much less. Um, Andre is looking at, uh, at CAMS, okay, which is an expanded audit report. In the expanded audit report, you are going to say CAMS stands for Critical Audit Methods. Okay, and so in old days you just had a standardized report. CAMS, soon and already in Europe. She knows more about CAMS than me, so don't let me say something wrong here. Okay, CAMS uh, will basically say what were the things that auditors worried about in this engagement. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, and it's still kind of evolving what this is going to be in. But the moment you have to disclose details of what you worried about, that, might, that will clearly affect, <coughs> will have to reframe what you do in an audit. There are questions. And uh, you are talking here about the delay of, uh, you are talking here about the delay between, uh, who was talking about the delay of, oh, you are talking about the delay of re regulation. And this is one of the critical things that we have substantial reframing and rethinking of things that you put in the camp. I, we think, or maybe I think, and uh, don't know what the other things, is that there be camps are going to be full of platitudes. It's going to be full of things you just must say, like management uh, and management reports now have, and like, uh, like uh, Yui and, uh, and Kevin discovered that the one A is the risk lists have, they basically all say the same kind of thing. And it's not interest that things that all say. It's interest the one that one company says different than the others. That's what really interests them. So you know you have to kind of reframe, reframe uh, based on the current technology. And there hasn't been a lot of thinking in auditing about now we have these new technologies what needs to be redone. But I, at least I wish, maybe I'm nearly sure about it, that that might bring us back to much more continuous audits. 
meaning what is the value of looking at the financial statement, uh, looking at the financial operations of a, in an economy that is trading every microsecond, looking at six months after the event. There's limited value. Should they eliminate the statutory audit? I don't think so. At least you don't think so. You want to teach auditing in the future, correct? Okay. I don't think so. And the firms don't want that either. But um, <coughs> we really need to be taught. Uh, we taught what's really beneficial. And that was, you know, I was very, I was fascinated hearing uh, Louis Dean talk about assurance and economics because, you know, we wrote that a long time ago. And uh, a lot of things are applicable. I think a few are not. Or etc. Meaning, for example, they are, we are talking about ERPs as a new technology. And that's when it was the, what they call the Y2K change, where year 2000 came in and companies adopted ERPs left and right because it was very difficult to maintain the old systems. Uh, ERPs are no novelty now. They have been around for a long time. And they are established. Well, then O'Leary said that 495 out of 500, uh, Fortune 500 use ERPs. And many of the large ones use two, three, four different types of ERPs. Uh, Rutgers, in the new ERP implementation, they're using like five different types of ERPs, kind of blended together. It's a big mess. Ask who. Hussein, is any one of you working with Hussein? No? You are. You work on that. Yeah, it's a big mess, right? Uh, but that's kind of modern system. That's the way they are. But the thing that that paper doesn't talk that I was thinking is uh, the web was just starting at that time, so we didn't talk too much about the web. It, it, we use the I use the terminology of networking there, and of course you could say that's the internet. But you know the world hasn't come to apps in everyone's hand, uh, monitoring any moment that you can, alerts coming to your cell phone, this kind of thing wasn't there at that time. And interesting from what we visualize and what we did in CPAPs, a lot of those things are still very applicable. Very, very applicable uh, in large contracts. I was just thinking about the last two papers, how a lot of these concepts are still applicable, but I think one of the, I guess one of the main main things that are changing is the mindset of how people are perceiving this new technological advancement and technological change. So for example, we meet with a lot of the firms and now we're seeing that they're interested in, in not only how they can keep up with the technology, but um, they do realize that they're importing the current um, statutory or importing requirements that we have now, it kind of doesn't match the technology that's in place. So if we can automate certain audit procedures, but if we can do this on an annual basis, is it is that reasonable? Does it really make sense to have a continuous type of audit that we do on like a quarterly or an annual basis? So I thought that was some, that's something new that was coming up. Yeah, and, and you know, it's uh, your generation or even the younger generation is here now, meaning this. You don't want to know your checking balance two days ago, okay? Think about this. 20 years ago, you would look at your monthly statement, and what would you do? Go into your stub in your checkbook and calculate how much you had spent. You have no idea. Today, what do you do? Go into Chase. Or Citibank, pick up your balance at this moment. And they know it, and they have to provide information structure that overnight is not good enough. They want at that particular moment, if you made a wire transfer to Avian, to that to be reflected. Because they need to bounce your check if you don't have enough money. And now you don't even write checks, you're doing electronic transfers, people to people that are immediate. And the business have to stay up with that. How does that work with annual reports and very short quarterly reports with no detail? 
sounds like a little bit obsolete, doesn't it? What do you guys think? Let, let me just annoy them a, a second. What do you think about, uh, about uh, how relevant are market studies looking at, uh, looking at financial variables uh, of quarterly and annual? Come on, someone needs to defend it. Don't be afraid, I don't get mad at you. I like that. I like the argument. So if you have financial statements that come out every microsecond, and it's continuous auditing, continuous reporting, you have balance sheets and income statements that are available after every transaction, I don't think that... Um, so 75% trades are conducted by machines, right? But the remaining 25%, I don't think that they have enough um, capacity to understand all that information in microseconds and then base their decisions upon that. So I think uh, that's one area where I think continuous auditing might not have a very good impact. Yeah, no, continuous reporting, but that's a... Uh, yeah, reporting. That's a uh, continuous... That, that's actually the discussion to be had. Actually, what I say, 75-80% of <coughs> transactions uh, of the stock market purchases are algorithmic. And then I say another 10% are index adjustments. You know, a lot of people are buying index, index funds. funds. Yes, and making the fund become and uh, follow its index requires trading. So it finishes up that maybe 10, 15% maximum of the trades are really value-based trade on other information. And when I argued my son about this, um, I said, no, no, those financials are very important. Etc. Et but you know, they go and they visit the companies, they ask them, they look at the competitors, uh, they look at comments on the internet about the products. You know, they are starting looking, looking at exogenous variables. Even these are value investors, these guys invest for five to ten years, which is the kind of the longer term, the more deep analysis. Um, and so that's why I ask about the market studies. The market studies are very oriented towards these financial statements that lag a lot. And uh, meaning there, there has been, I, I just forget his name, guy we hired from uh, Water, uh, John, Michael, I think. Michael, uh, Michael Cardio. Michael? Cardio. Huh? Yeah. Huh? Last name is Cardio. Yes, yes. He actually was looking at first differences of price variations. Remember that? Yeah. So it's a very timely type of measure. The problem is the other side of this equation were very stable. They were very old fashioned. And so there are analyses you can do you can do on this thing. Um, that's not my area of research, I don't know too much about it, but it's very interesting thinking about it. So you can modernize that re research to a certain degree. You know, the Ball and Brown model, uh, which was the first linking market value of companies to, in this case, earnings, explained 40 to 60 percent of variance. The R squares are adjusted R squares, and that meaning today is 5 percent, 6 percent, etc. So there has been a substantial erosion of the value of the information that we publish electronically. When I said this to my son, it's like five percent. He just he was ready to cut my head off. <laughs> ah, very important information, etc. But it's, it needs to be talked. Back to back to this. What's the difference between continuous monitoring and continuous auditing? Um, uh, the guys from KPMG basically say continuous monitoring management does it. Continuous audit auditors do. And I usually made a little bit uh, of a difference here, saying uh, you need an infrastructure for collecting the data. The thing that uh, it showed, you know, you need a way that you collect the data for continuous audit, continuous audit. But continuous auditing needs monitoring data. Correct? It needs data. It might management might collect other data too. But continuous audit needs that data to make those value, these various decisions. And so I always say there is a, 
audit layer that management doesn't need. But management has all kind of other information that they need for other purposes, for monitoring operations, for monitoring manufacturing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I, I don't have a lot of doubt, although I might be a minority, that we are moving in this direction. I always say, you go to an ERP, and ERP is already a continuous monitoring device. Things like cash, receivables, payables, and inventory manufacturing are very close to real time. Why? Because in cash, you need to apply money on overnight, or borrow money overnight. So if you don't have those balances, you can do that. And all companies do that. Receivables, you have to take discounts and give discounts. 2% discount for 30 days, every day you have to do that. Payables is just the opposite of that, so you need that. And just-in-time manufacturing needs real-time inventory at the point of production. So those four variables, have to be very close to, at least overnight. Now the question is the other ones, how often do you measure? How often do you measure property, plant, and equipment? And why would you measure it very far and every minute? Do you gain anything calculating depreciation a million times a day? Uh, do you gain anything updating your inventory, your property, plant, and equipment assets every minute. Maybe there are some uh, some issues of uh, covenants that you have to keep a certain level. There might be some reasons you will do that. But you meet, measure a lot of things real time that are important to measure. So continuous assurance. Is, the so continuous assurance is part of monitoring. Continuous monitoring. Right? Say that again. Continuous assurance. Is continuous part assurance is, I say, assurance is an umbrella, and it has whole set of confirmatory type of measurements. Okay, and there are different products of measurement. One of the traditional assurance things is the in external audit. The internal audit is another assurance product. It's not necessary a subset of external audit. It's different, okay? And, you know, now these days, companies are very, very worried about cybersecurity breaches. So uh, I think cybersecurity monitoring is a part of assurance. However, businesses that are trying uh, trying to make money uh, of it might not want it to be a traditional insurance product, they might want to be independent of it. They would like the government to come in and say you need to issue an opinion and doesn't have to be an account. And this is not so far fetched. Um, uh, the AICPA issued a cyber insurance guidance, but what they tried to do is force into the traditional audit model, and that doesn't work very well. I wrote an article about that. Uh, but uh, there are a whole, whole, four, whole set of assurance type of products, uh, Samuel, falling under this generic umbrella. Assurance is verification. And why do you need verification? You need verification because management is here, the data is here, and there's a lot of things in between. And sometimes you need confidence that this is being done right. You have many subsidiaries, you have partners that uh, profit, uh, share with you. There are all kinds of reasons why the government might need assurances that uh, certainly so the stakeholders of assurance are many. Society, governments, partners, uh, customers, suppliers, stockholders. But of course, when we talk about traditional audit, we really very often emphasizing on stockholders. Correct? Yeah. 
So back to back to CACM. So I typically say you need a measurement infrastructure for collecting data close to real time. And you use that for monitoring the business, you use that for assuring the business. And I noticed that uh, during the you picked up the meta control, or what was it? It was a, I used the word meta control. And uh, I had that in the, in the part paper, I use that very often. What is a meta control? It's control of controls. What do you mean control of controls? Verifying if controls are working. And you know, you could easily argue that uh, continuous assurance is a job uh, for traditional management because you are checking, checking very close to the event if, a, if an event is happening. And that's the discussion of separating uh, the roles of assurance and audit assurance and measurement. Okay, just a discussion. I I don't, you know, in our continuous art symposia very often we have panels that have these arguments. I find this kind of not going anywhere. In the old days, in the first continuous auditing symposia, the big discussion was what is continuous art? And maybe five, ten years ago we started talking about arguing about what's the difference between CA and CM. And now no one is talking about any of these, they are talking about analytics and big data. And this conference, what, what were they talking about? Blockchain. Half of the stuff in this conference was kind of blockchain-ish. Blockchain will pass. Okay, blockchain is a data storage technology. The applications of blockchain what Andreas work, uh, smart contracts, and you can audit, can be part of assurance. But Andrea might stuck stuck to her guns and say this is uh, this is not part of auditing. This is part of management. Can I give you that that point? I, I, I'm not too interested in these discussions. I'm more interested in what what we implement. Um, I want to ask Jamie to share. Jamie has been talking uh, with uh, this guy, A. Michael Smith, and this guy is a PwC in charge of part of the entire audit practice of the entire, and basically he has, has tens of clients doing quote unquote continuous audit. And Jamie kind of has been, is going to be writing it up as an article. Um, and I, uh, I think what he's calling is just kind of doing, repeating the same audit many times, not an infrastructure like we have. And maybe uh, we are wrong and uh, it's not worth having an infrastructure like this, but I'm, I would be very surprised if businesses that operate on real time don't need some form to make very sure that the real time process don't go crazy. Like the example I gave you about billing going crazy. You need to be able to stop things if things don't work. Call that management, call that assurance. No my country. I'm not, not so, so interested in this. Okay, um, I thought uh, maybe we could do one more of the papers. Um, should we do the principles one? Yeah, is that one or the Siemens paper? You know what, let's do the Siemens paper because it is, the principles is a little bit similar to this one. To the Louis paper, so uh, very, huh? very, similar. very similar. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we don't have the complete equation paper in our syllabus. I think it's in the methodology. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I'll tell you what, what actually happened. Uh, I was just describing to you this. this uh, these are the switches. Okay. Uh, and then we collect the data for monthly billing, and then we did all kind of analytic things. Okay. And so what we are trying to do is to make very sure that all the things that were read out of the switches 
actually got here. Okay? And then these things broke, broke uh, each telephone call into five elements, and you did other things with those five elements. And so we tried to write equations that link this to this to this. And when we were doing that, a guy called Andy Sherman, he was a physicist, said, oh, we do this in physics all the time. They're called continuity equations, okay? Whereby you relate different states of the world by analytic methods. So that's, that was the origination of this thing. And I actually have a chart, I probably can produce it for you, whereby I, I do the telephone billing set cycle and show some relationships on that. And then I have that <coughs> thing varied for allies. And I show the relationship of database of reservations and other pieces that create predictive values. Uh, and then Alex uh, and me worked on this project for uh, HCA, Hospital Corporation of America. And basically we had one warehouse, 10 hospitals being supplied by them, and we are trying to create the relationships from supply house to uh, hospital to client, to customer. Okay, and we wrote equations, and in that writing of equations, we wrote equations, uh, we also examined frequency of information, get information every hour, every minute, Remember that we were talking today, this morning on that, on the frequency and the aggregation of data? And I said, there is a paper there, and Alex said, there is no paper in there. So, that's common. That's common. I think there is a paper in there, with actually what you are doing. You know, he, Nubidin has been examining the Arkansas data. And uh, there, I think there was a clear effect of, uh, what kind of aggregation of data you need to do certain predictions. You are looking at predictions, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So it's very because we, you know, most of the time, AT&T, uh, Itaú Bank, uh, Dr. Gamble, these guys, we have data sets and uh, an audit problem to work with this. In the, in the Arkansas data, we have the data sets, but we don't have the company. So we have tried to figure out what to do with the data. It's not, it's not the same thing. But they are, I think they are fantastic data sets, aren't they? They are fantastic data sets, but they have been castrated. Correct? Cut a little bit. You can, of course, run some most of analysis. You can, of course, run most of analysis on them and predict them. Even if they are, uh, have uh, contained uh, purposefully inserted errors. Uh, you can uh, treat these errors as uh, real errors and try to catch them so it's coming. Yeah, that, that's what I thought was going to happen. I, I, I didn't know. You know, until you touch data, you don't know what's going to happen in the analysis. But uh, what do they say? If you torture data enough, it will confess. Oh, it's so sad. <laughs> that's a joke. Or this or any, what they say that is lies, then lies, and statistics. <coughs> Want another one on the bed? No, 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 it's not a bad joke. Because no one is finding that funny. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that when you analyze this to it, uh, we are going to find a lot of interesting things to analyze there. I mean, it's an incredible data curve to of six reasonably large companies with a lot of details on them, and the data set was assembled to basically teach ERPs, to teach uh, engineers or whatever the usage of, of ERPs, okay? But it gives us uh, data that we haven't seen a lot of, kind of very detailed data on their sales. Very, very detailed data on their sales. And so sales and uh, each one of the six one has kind of a different connotation. I, I think I said, I was told by Ben Schneider that they refresh the data, they improve the data. 
Yes, and uh, Professor Kogan also claims that if someone has the original data, they're just... Uh, yeah, that, that's Kogan's theory. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very... Uh, we'll be able to use that data. I bet you that in a year we are going to have papers submitted on, those, on that data. Pretty cool. I mean, it's so difficult to get data these days. So difficult. But on the other hand, uh, you know, there are all this government open data, and there are things like that. We have been circulating um, emails between uh, several AIS books, senior professors, and uh, uh, people of Arkansas, too. I think it's him. <coughs> uh, it's putting together a list of places you can find data. And of course, Arkansas is one of them, but there is open data. There is a whole set of places that have. Northeastern University has published uh, BIMPO. And BIMPO is basically data from liquor stores, for the, like wine and et cetera, et cetera. And we don't know how truthful that data is, but it's a big data set that can be used. And uh, she is using it in our visualization project. But data, of course, is. And you see, I'll tell you something that you guys don't know. Um, the world changed in research when CompuStat and CRISP was published. Because from one second to the other, a lot of people migrated to market research. And why was that? Yeah, because you had data. My, my student, Janine Knopf at Columbia, she spent <coughs> couple of years doing dissertation, year and a half she spent in the library collecting data on the venture conversion, manual. So by the time that she had the database of the venture conversions, <coughs> she didn't have a lot of time to do a video analysis on the dissertation. Okay? And so, you know, this privilege you have with, with CRISP, CompuStar, uh, and etc., is you can be the data to help. And you don't have to collect the data manually. And what's happening, people are beating the data well and finding other sources to link to it. And some other sources are manually collected too. So it's different. It's a different world. Yeah. To build up your idea that uh, data is very hard to capture, um, I agree with that because I worked with a startup company. I started, I worked with them and uh, in regards to data is really hard to collect because of the normalization of data as well. Uh, in regards to what I worked with was um, XBRL uh, tax in the financial statements. And it was very hard that uh, a lot of companies that will sometimes, if they will use the normalized ticker on their XBRL tag, that they will uh, you know, just make up one and it will be hard for analysts to be able to actually compare those numbers Sometimes there will be mistakes with uh, a tag pertaining to a value on the financial statement, but uh, it's wrong with those. But, but that's already a much easier problem because right. people do file the fifth XPRL statement, and you can go into Edgar and pick them up. Yeah, you're right, that's an illustration of difficult data, but much more difficult is all kind of data that's there on paper or that is there for you not to accept. When I, uh, I mentioned last time, when I talk about exogenous data now, I talk about social media data, I talk about weather data, I talk about, um, about uh, IoT data, Internet of Things data. Uh, and you know, for example, Amazon, has maybe 40% of all electronic sales in the world. Okay, and guys like Apple, out of data from your cell phone, uh, Fitbit, all these guys have their data sources. And, you know, it's a little bit of a different problem from the past. Uh, the one you described is more modern problem. In the past, data existed in paper. Or never was collected. It was, the data didn't even exist. Events happened, but they were not existed. Now, a lot of people are, a lot of things is tracked. The question is getting access, understanding it, 
and understanding the biases of it. Meaning if Amazon has 40% of all electronic purchases, and assuming that you would have access to that. Next thing is, what is the bias introduced by the fact that 60% are not collected? Is that a very different nature of the data? Is it totally crazy? Okay. Google. Each one of you Googles 10, 20, 30 times a day, maybe more. Correct? Um, that data in some form is available. She used Google Trends, correct? Uh, they give you an app to use. But it avoids you to go to some privacy invasion level. And there are different analysis to be done with, with that type of thing. Now this guy, um, what was his name? Seth, uh, what was his name? Seth. Huh? Seth or Stephen Jackowitz, yeah. Yes, something like that. This guy wrote this book, Everybody Laughs. I mentioned it also last time. And there he gets access to a pornographic database. So he links Google to pornographic database and finds all kind of sexual preference data. And of course, this is what you are doing with CompuStar now. Everyone is with CompuStar. Pick up CompuStar, get audit analytics, get uh, stock price, used to be crisp, I don't know what it's called now, pull them together. <coughs> and then find some other data set to link in there. You know, extract something from 10 Ks that's not a computer using sick info. And that's what people are doing, linking these things. And it's not only about what data is available, but it's also the data that's available, what is the bias in there, what is the limitation. It's a fairly big change. And article I sent you, uh, about science or is the death of theory talks about it. and that's something you need to think I know that some of your professors here would say absolutely not you have to formulate the hypothesis etc etc I was expecting Alex to say that years ago when I talked to him about that he didn't say that he actually said yes that's the way people are doing it. he didn't formulate a new way to do theories but he he agreed that that's the way it's being done. So, the world is changing. We have a, a, another 15 minutes or so. Can you go fast over the CCM paper? Are you doing the CCM paper?
because uh, Siemens is an ERP-centric firm, so it, they have a lot of work to be done to audit this system. But uh, at that time, a lot of work is done manually, was done manually, and not continuously. And uh, I want several things incurred in this process. So in order to save costs, like uh, in their in the appendix of this paper, they have calculated the uh, potential cost savings. Uh, it uh, amounts to like twenty million dollars. So uh, the motivation of Siemens doing this is to save costs and also to uh, better comply with the uh, SOX. Uh, this paper was written in 2005. Okay, so uh, this is the background. And uh, so to do this, uh, uh, we first need to determine the audit scope, which is determined by, uh, uh, by audit action sheet. And this was what uh, the professor talked about when we were uh, studying the blockchain. And this uh, AAS. Can I just give you an explanation? Right. What they did is Siemens decided that they didn't want to hire auditors to audit SAP. They hired SAP specialists and taught them audit. Said it was easier instead of teaching auditors how to do SAP. That's what they decided. And so what they did is they created a list of AAS, audit action sheets. What you do in audit? And they had 300 of these sheets with an average 10 actions per sheet. And that's what they had. So they had it nicely organized what you do in an SAP audit. OK, and what Rod did now with uh, blockchain, he tried to apply audit sheet to determine what needs to be audited in a blockchain, correct? Yes. And his conclusion was that most of those things don't need to be done. Uh, however, there are new things that need to be done. Is that correct? Yeah. There's new risks. With Andrea, every time I say nonsense, call my attention. Okay? <laughs> yeah, and this AAS uh, was determined by the Siemens Auditor changing 
their way of voting. So I think the basic idea is the same for the Siemens project and the experiment project that we are doing. <laughs> And, this, is, uh, this is like June, you know, I say A to her, she's immediately first A and B. That's what she <laughs> said. Yeah, so, and as I mentioned, uh, now we are doing this continuous monitoring of business process uh, control. So this control has some uh, prerequisite. So basically, uh, the Monitoring and control should be uh, automatic. And uh, we should notice that the monitoring is actually based on controls because we monitor controls. So, yeah, as I said, they have this kind of relationship over there. And uh, to verify the existence, uh, correctness, and functioning of the business process controls, we have three ways. So first, uh, and most obvious one is that we just observe. Uh, and the second is we, uh, because we want to test how this controls is actually uh, is working or not. So we can pretend that we uh, violate some rules and see how, like whether the system will give us some alarm. So this is called execute, uh, execute prohibited behavior. But as you can imagine, we are like we are testing the system by violating some rules. It's not like not very. Um, it, uh, it has some costs in it. And the third way is we retrieve the control settings from the ERP system. Basically, uh, the system uh, by some codes, and you uh, look at the uh, underlying control. Uh, codes in the system, and this is the read-only process. So through this process, you are, uh, you are not going to change anything. So uh, it is uh, perceived as a safe and independent way. So in this project, <coughs> we basically use the third method to check or to verify the BP control. And uh, in the process of monitoring, as professor just mentioned, we compare the actual results with the benchmark. And uh, then we can select some except exceptions. But here we need to pay attention that since we are using this continuous uh, monitoring, so it might happen that we will have a lot of exceptions. So we will have something called uh, alarm flag. So this is also one of the projects that we are doing in radar. It's the math problem, uh, the math project. So we are going to find ways to filter those exceptions. So we have this concept called exception of exception. Right, Andrea? Yeah, yes. Exceptional exceptions. Yeah, exception of exceptions. Yeah, math is a new name for exception. Yeah, beautiful eye. Yeah. And uh, as Arian just said, uh, the system design for this uh, uh, CMBPC, <coughs> there are basically two ways. So uh, the first one is called monitoring and control layer. So this layer is independent from the ERP system. And uh, basically, uh, it has this advantage of independent. <coughs> However, uh, it's uh, <coughs> not so easy to query into this ERP system. I don't know uh, why it is this, because I didn't dig deep, deep into this paper. Uh, uh, and another one is the subsystem of the ERP, which is called the embedded audit module. So this module is usually provided by the ERP vendor, and it's embedded in the uh, ERP itself. So it has this advantage of curing data, digging data directly from this ERP. However, because it's a subsystem of this ERP, so uh, it may have this issue of you know, violation of independency. So in our project, we use the first one, the MCL. And this MCL will interact with our ERP system and get data from so, but where, from where it will obtain data? Now let's look at this 
ERP system. So ERP system basically has three independent layers. And it has the database where all the data is stored, and the application layer uh, where you, uh, our logic is coded and the uh, code is executed. And we have this presentation layer where, like, uh, from where they prepare the data for the users to see. So uh, uh, intuitively, we will think uh, if we want to obtain data, we just interact the uh, MCL with the database. However, the database of uh, a firm is usually very enormous and complex. So it's uh, not very uh, feasible for us to uh, use the database you know, to feed the data to the MCL. So what we do is we uh, use this interface to uh, let MCL to interact with the application layer. And uh, when we actually implement, we get data from this uh, ERP system called SAP, which was uh, audited under this e-audit uh, of Siemens. And uh, here, the project focused on some um, like basic uh, controls, for example, <coughs> the password controls, which applies for any SAP system. So uh, we take a look at this uh, password control. So basically, uh, there are five uh, controls that were selected here. So they have this login fail user auto. Okay, the name is too long, but basically one example is uh, the password uh, should have some uh, length. So here, like they say, the minimum length has to be eight characters. And the, the password has to be expired after 90 days, something like that. So uh, the thing here is because we want to uh, to C and BTC, right? So uh, we say that those procedures should be formalized. However, there are kind of issues that we need to uh, pay attention. So those rules, they are pretty much formalized because we uh, give a threshold of what is you know, wrong and right. However, when the auditors, when they are actually uh, rating, like give a score to these, uh, to these, how to say, uh, rules, it's not very formalized. So in Siemens, the auditors uh, were required to give a score of zero to four of how well the, uh, manage, uh, the managers comply with this requirement. So the problem is it's easy to uh, you know, give score of zero or four. Zero means you didn't comply with those rules at all, not at all. Four means you comply with them completely. However, what does those one to three mean? So there's subjectivity inside. So this project is uh, meant to like solve this kind of uh, funny uh, problem. So what we did. Uh, what they did there is they use this scoring method, which means, for example, they will give them a score uh, about how well this requirement is satisfied. For example, this, if this password is not eight, or uh, the password doesn't expire within 90 days, then this is an if-then function. So they give a score according to this function. So in this way, we actually formalize this non-formalized <coughs> process, and we can get exceptions from this scoring method. And uh, so this screenshot is from the uh, interface of the programs that our team generated. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, from uh, in the system, we can also trace back to the source file. So this is the interface for that. And uh, from this paper, we actually uh, like learned how the theories can be applied <coughs> to the field. And, uh, and we can learn from this experiment <coughs> that, as I mentioned, 
mentioned in my first uh, three slides, uh, <coughs> in the process of implementing continuous auditing, like we first need to find what are the procedures that are repetitive, right? And then we first follow their existing audit procedures, and next, find uh, something to be refrain. And also, as I mentioned, uh, in a process of continuous auditing, we may have these exploding exceptions. So uh, more ways should be found to uh, filter those exceptions. And uh, there is also issue of how long we should keep the audit trail. Uh, the purpose to keep this audit trail is you keep the evidence, right? So it's easy to say like the minimum time that you should keep the trail. However, it's hard to set the maximum time. Why is that issue? Because we have limited space in our database. So if we accumulate the data and uh, don't clean the trail, it may cause some problems. So this is uh, listed as a uh, discussion topic in this paper. And also, uh, because this is a uh, continuous uh, system, so someone needs to develop software for them, but who are going to develop that? And the paper mentioned uh, the best candidate to develop this is the existing audit uh, soft software vendors, because they have this uh, data set or like experience in doing this. So this is the main idea of this. Okay. So this area is called CCM, Continued Control Monitoring. And uh, basically, if you have a list of controls, some of them can be monitored. And if this particular control can be A and B, and if not B, it's a safety of another. Same kind of thing, variance type of thing. ACL, one of the computer vendors, picked up this methodology and uh, sold the product, sells the product using greater patterns of it, and sells the product based on this research. And it's basically looking at the parameters of control, in this case, an SAP, seeing, uh, and the ones that are parameterizable and you have a clear, this should be this, not that, you can't. And what happens is that you are running an application something happens and you override the control because you need something for the client to be done. Like for example, uh, give you an example. Uh, Arian has a credit limit of $10,000. Okay, Arian writes a check and the check exceeds the ten, uh, his balance by, of $10,000. Usually the branch manager gets his check. He has to decide I reject this check or I accept the check. Why can he accept the check? Because Elliot might have another account that he has a million dollars and uh, he doesn't know, know the client. Or Elliot might have deposited a government check from the Brazilian government that will be honored, but takes three days to clear. So the, he has to have some leeway to override controls. So the ERP controls are not the totally fixed, you can override them. And this analysis informs you when overrides happen, when something happened out of the out of the usual. And so the continuous audit has three pieces. One piece is what I talked in the CPAS project. Take checking if the data model and the data are very different. The second one is control, checking if the controls and what actually happened and what it should be are very different. And the third thing we call uh, continuous risk monitoring analysis, whereby you look at the risk that the company is undergoing with some proxies, which we call key risk indicators. And if the risk changes very much, you have to rethink your own. There are three pieces of this story. And I'm going to stop here. Sorry about holding you back. Okay, no bathroom place.